All right, so welcome to today's fantastic episode of The Real Deal On. And one of the, the fun things I, for me I get to do is the introduction, but I get to do it in the fun radio voice that um, you know, kind of takes it to another level. So I've printed it out and prepare yourself for an intro that will be the best one you've had so far today. Today? Yes. Okay. So I can see this and use it in the future. If, if, should you want to. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Bill Borcelli is a hands-on guy with broad industry experience over the course of his career, which has spanned over three decades. He's worked at various record labels early in his career, as well as Premier, PROs, BMI, and ASCAP and the National Association of Music Publishers. He served for over two decades as Paul McCartney's longtime senior vice president of licensing, promoting, promotion, and new product development for McCartney's MPL Communications, Inc. His iconic movie placements include Unchained Melody from Ghost, Big Girls Don't Cry and Stay, Dirty Dancing, as well as in such classic films as Shawshank Redemption, the Austin Powers film series, Jerry Maguire, and dozens more. After leaving MPL in 2006, Bill was named the EVP for Music Publishing Company of America, where he oversaw day-to-day -day activities for administration and licensing, as well as securing various publishing rights. In addition, he was co-executive producer for several artist releases through MPCA's legacy artist record label, Hi-Fi Recordings. Bill served as co-managing partner at Ergo Entertainment from 2014 to 2018. A round of applause for Mr. Bill Porcelli. Very nice, very nice. My production. That's Best one all day, right? That's it. We're done. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule uh, to spend with us to share really the ups and downs, the ins and outs of your illustrious career. Um, we know each other from uh, music. Uh, my peak of my career was when Napster came out and I was not as focused in staying in the industry as, as you were. So start, you know, where, how did you even get into music? <clears throat> or even good. before that, what were you doing before that? Like, how did you? Yeah. Well, always good talking to you, Doug. Uh, uh, thanks for the invite. Um, you know, I mean, like so many people, you know, music fan growing up and, um, I started as a songwriter and um, that was kind of the ambition, you know, to, uh, to write songs. And, um, and I got into it and, uh, and, and I guess there comes a, a, a time in your life when you kind of have to ask the real question, how good am I? You know, can I really have a career at this? And, and I guess I realized, and I was truthful to myself, I said, well, you know, I love, the business, but I, I, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm really have the gift, you know, that, that, that uh, gift of a gene a, a, as a writer, but I certainly appreciate it. But I love music, you know, and, and even going way back when, I was always curious about, you know, uh, who wrote the song, you know, who produced the song, who engineered the song, all the behind the scenes thing, which is you know, uh, now it's harder and harder to do, you know, with, with, with streaming. You don't have the back of an album cover to kind of see where it was recorded and, 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 and who were the essential people that created the record. So the one thing I appreciated songs, love songs to this day in all types of genres. So um, when I kind of came to the realization is that uh, I, I didn't think I was going to have a, a meaningful career as a, a songwriter. I wanted to get into the business. I mean, I, I, uh, and so what I did was way back when, you know, certainly uh, when, when I was in college, um, started to uh, um, go to uh, uh, these meetings and they had these seminars and these groups and these networks uh, networking groups. Um, and uh, I learned more about the business. I learned what ASCAP was, what BMI was, the Performing Rights Societies. 
um, the Harry Fox Agency, and all of these companies which I eventually ended up working for. Uh, and it's been a long road because I've, I've worked pretty much almost at every facet of the industry over, over almost a 40 year career. And um, so it was, uh, so that's, that's how it started. And I mean, back in the, you know, the, uh, the late seventies and Atlantic records landing a first job and first boss was Dave glue, who uh, a very famous uh, record executive Atlantic Epic records over the years. And from there, uh, you know, I, I've made through the record companies. I, I, I worked for different record companies as the administrative assistant, as a, uh, as a gopher, anything that I could possibly do, I would do, you know, and, and you learn and you network and you meet people and, and, uh, and so many people that I kind of join the industry with, you know, they've gone on to do some fabulous things. And uh, uh, so that's, that's how it started. I guess that's how anybody's career starts. You know, you, you, you got to take those small steps and then you- What was your first gig? What was that? What was your first gig? Well, it was Atlantic Records. As it was, in, in it, well, it was it was just a, a an administrative assistant. It's uh -huh. funny I had an opportunity that week. Um, uh, I had a two job opportunities. There was a page at NBC because I my degree was in media communications. So uh, you know I had I had love for that, and I had two offers. It was a, a, a job. Uh, an entry level position at Atlantic. And then there was, um, there was this uh, page for at NBC, which you, that's how you got started uh, in, in the company started as a page, you work in different departments and hopefully you, you, you connect. But um, uh, I had, uh, uh, I went in for the interview and, uh, and just, it, it just drew me, you know? So, uh, I mean, it wasn't a sexy job. It wasn't a fantasy, uh, you know, fantasy job. It was, uh, it was uh, making Xerox copies, running errands, doing mm -hmm. you know, messenger work, ev everything and anything. But the environment was really cool. You know, you really, you know, you you got to to meet songwriters and famous people. You're seeing on the, uh, you know, in the lobby and things like that. So when you're was this in you know, Manhattan? You're 18, yeah. When you're 18, you know you're you know, 17, 18 years old. You know that's uh, that's pretty influential, and it 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 kind of grabbed me. But um, you know, certainly from there, you know, I had brief stints with um, with uh, uh, with ASCAP, with BMI, with the Harry Fox Agency, and then the big the big one was was MTL Communications, which is uh, Paul McCartney's uh, publishing and management company which i started in the mid 80s and i expected to be there for about two years it, it ended up two decades and um you know that that certainly uh, exposed me to everything from the world of licensing and hollywood and movies and and um it was a great time it was a great time i, I and i i got to uh create some great relationships uh, in, in Hollywood, in all aspects of the music industry, and uh, you know, worked on some great projects and so many projects, you know, uh, that I've worked on, you know, every day. They're on television at, at some point. You know, you you see Dirty Dancing or Shawshank Redemption or Ghosts or Austin Powers or uh, any of these movies. Um, it's good to know that that I had contributed in some way, and um, but uh, that that's pretty much you know, how, uh, how it got started. And, uh, after that, you know, I, it's all about reinventing yourself because mm -hmm. nothing is forever in any aspect of life. The only thing constant in life is change, which we all know. And, um, the one thing, uh, that, uh, well, I, I learned a ton of things. And one thing is that you don't want to be one dimensional. And, uh, that's, that's what I've done as I've, uh, as you get older, you know, you don't get smarter, you get wiser. And uh, fortunately, I was able to utilize all of the, the lessons I've learned, all of the people and, and all of the failures. You, you, you come out of that, if you can come out of that strong, you know, um, you, you pretty much uh, 
you know, can, uh, can survive. Would you say like, obviously those two decades that you were with uh, MPL was during some pretty turbulent times in the music industry, a lot of reinventing in how music was delivered and a lot of shifts. How did you guys navigate that? I mean, did you know where the puck was going? Well, the thing is, you know, we were a publishing company. I mean, that was our, our primary function outside of all the artists and, and, and his, his deals with Capitol Records. Um, the, the great thing, and it's really interesting about publishing, because it's a, it's a, it's a big, big, big business today. And, it's, uh, and MPL is a publishing company, independent publishing company, which is the prototype for so many of the publishing companies today. It's a, it's a, it's a very big uh, industry. Uh, it's it's something that investors uh, have gotten involved in, in in a very deep way, but uh, the prototype has always been MPL. It's a combination of uh, copyrights and popular copyrights uh, uh, that you have for administration. Some you own, but it's their their revenue generators, their annuities, and if you you've got the quality I mean, surpassing uh, surpassing the um, the physical. Um, uh, purchases and it's um, it's something that uh, you know the only thing constant in life is change and and that's what's happening it'd be interesting to see where it goes from here uh, but um, but yeah there was change but the one thing uh, that is very solid is always been music publishing you know those those classic copyrights that you know you turn on a commercial you watch a movie and you instantly recognize that song uh, their annuities, their diamonds, their and if you're fortunate enough to to be a part of that and, or have written one of them uh, or represent those copyrights, um, you know you're 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 in a good place. Absolutely. I mean, what one thing that did happen while you were talking, Zoom shut down and came back on, and so I don't know how much they <laughs> how much we got went through. Um, I said but, some great things there. I know. I, I'm sure you did. It's, uh, it's incredible, like where it stopped. So, so what do you need me to back up if you have well, a question? So you shared. You started to share about um, the the fact that investors were getting into um, yeah. into it, and then when it went blank for a bit, I started to. I just shared a little bit that it reminded me a little bit of like mortgages as like an asset. So you could buy yeah. like banks buy mortgages, the notes investors are buying publishing because they are creating income and then there what you do is you find yeah, new ways to monetize it right they're they're annuities particularly if you've got those classic songs you know because <laughs> oh, you went blank there's a movie with an instantly recognizable song you know those are what the advertisers and the sponsors respond to that's what the consumer responds to um so those those classic songs are incredibly uh, uh, profitable um, for the writers, for the publishers, and um, it's uh, it's it's a business that is uh, uh, the uh, there are a number of companies right now that are backed by major private equity hedge fund mm -hmm. high wealth individuals that recognize that the, the copyright business is a, is a huge huge business. And if you've you've got the right uh, you've got the right copyright assets, um, you can you can have a very successful business. So one of the things, and and this was always like a little bit of a I think for some not a gray area but a, of area of confusion to some extent is there are the the masters the the recording rights and then right. there's the publishing. Right. Um, and I know that Russ and I actually, we got hired a few times to recreate songs because they didn't sure. want to pay the mechanicals, sure. right? Sure. What impact does that have? And as a strategy, does that, right. from, from the artist standpoint, does that have any impact? Well, of course, you know, I mean, you see it today with Taylor Swift, who has, uh, has issues with her former management. And and uh, she's re-recording her songs. I know a number of artists uh, over the years who don't have any claim to the master recordings. Now, keep in mind for those people who don't know, 
you know, uh, when you hear a song, like for instance, if, if you hear a, um, uh, a Beatles song, so to speak, um, you, um, you hear the recording, <clears throat> which is a Beatles recording, which is owned by, in this case, Capitol Records, okay? And then there's the song, the publishing, the actual song itself, which was written by uh, Lennon McCartney. So um, the publisher has the right to re-record the song. And, and a popular song can be recorded thousands and thousands of times, but there's only one original master recording. So um, what happens for a, for a songwriter, certainly it's in their best interest to get as many people to record the song as possible. So re-records, you know, are essential. Advertising uh, agencies use them, sound-alikes. Um, so, uh, and that the one thing is, you, that's where the publisher um, makes their money. And like I said, the, the master recording is owned by the, the, the recording company. Sometimes the artist owns it, but that's only one, uh, one aspect. It's, it's one recording as opposed to owning uh, the copyright where you can do many, many different things. You can't do anything to a master recording, but you can re-record over and over and over. Which is what happened in the sampling days. At first, people were using the actual record, and then right. they it's got, expensive. yeah, got very expensive. It's like, it's oh, let's just re-record it, make it sound exactly the same, and have the same effect. Right, and it's more cost-effective. You know, right. it's, more, it's more cost-effective because you do have to pay the, the royalty. Um, you know, to the master owners. I, I've been in the middle of a lot of those. I've worked on some really interesting things. As a matter of fact, I worked on the movie uh, Austin Power Gold Member and uh, uh, the song Hard Knock Life, mm -hmm. which was, uh, was written by Martin Charnin, the lyric for the show Annie. Yep. And, uh, and uh, Jay Z did his version of Hard Knock Life, you know, and it was in the movie um, in a Gold Member in the, in the prison scene. So, um, you know, there, there are so many things you can do and, and re-records are fabulous. And when you can have a contemporary artist do their slant on, a, on a, an old standard or an, uh, an older tune, that, it's great. It's great for the business. It's great for everyone, you know, to, um, to get exposure to these songs. So when I, my first, you know, like my major music experience was with Rick Wake and Richie Kanata and, and that whole thing. And Rick's model was create the song for the artist in mind, do it complete, make the record, and then present it to the artist to say, look, sure. you'd sound great on this. So we'd hire a singer that sounded like Celine Dion when we presented sure. the song to Celine. She already could hear her voice, right? The A&R guys. In the publishing world where you're sharing kind of some of the ways to you know, get songs and films and, and all of that. Do you also, are you like, were you part of like, do you reach out to somebody and say, you know what, we would love to have, and using gold member, I, I don't think that was the case. I think Jay-Z had already done that, but right. do you go, you know, it'd be great if we could put this song in done by that person and then you orchestrate sure. a re-record. Is that part of the, the oh, gig that you, you would do? Sure, that, that you know, the, every aspect of it, when you're, when you're representing the copyrights as publishers do, um, every possible scenario comes up. I mean, in many cases, um, you know, you, you, you'll get a request from the music supervisor on the film, we want this, we want this, we're, we're looking to use Tony Bennett's I Left My Heart in San Francisco or whatever it is, or, you know, Luck Be a Lady by Frank Sinatra. Um, in some cases, they know exactly what they want. I worked with Nora Ephron, who was, uh, you know, Sleepless in Seattle and, and, um, and so many incredible movies. But I did Sleepless in Seattle, and we had in the wee small hours of the morning. And um, she uh, utilized the Carly Simon version of In the Wee Small. It's been recorded by many different people. But um, in many instances, uh, you know, and I've worked with Cameron Crowe. Uh, on Jerry Maguire, you know, and, and uh, he had almost famous, he won the Academy Award and Vanilla Sky, which McCartney got nominated for an Academy Award. Some directors have a vision, you know, they want this recording and that's it, regardless of the, of, of the cost, uh, because that's always an issue. You know, I, I hate to say that um, in many times, the first budget that's cut in a, in a, in a film 
is the music budget. Hmm. So then there's a compromise. Okay, well, we can't afford Sinatra's My Way. Can we get somebody to re-record it that sounds yeah, like yeah. Sinatra? And that would even be uh, cheaper to send someone into the studio, actually reproduce it, re-everything, than right. to uh, so, pay for the original. Right, exactly. I mean, it's, it's more cost-effective. But again, there's certain directors, their specific Penny Marshall was like that. Uh, Cameron Crowe's like that. Nora Ephron was like that. This is, this is what we want. And, uh, but there are times we will suggest songs. Uh, I mean, uh, a number of cases. You know, look, I, one of the people asked me what was my favorite placement uh, where I feel that I, I contributed uh, quite a bit. I'll never forget. Uh, there was uh, back in 92, 93. Um, uh, it was Arlene Fishback, who was a, a, a music supervisor and a music consultant on many films. And uh, she comes into our office and she says, OK, I, I, I've got a couple of movies here. I've got this one one movie and um, uh, we need a couple of pieces of, of music. But the, this this one, she goes, I've got uh, it's it's opening the opening scene of the movie. Uh, main character Andy Dufresne is sitting in his car. His wife's in a motel having an affair. He's sitting outside in the car. It's raining. What song is playing on the radio? She said to me. And I said, okay, well, what's the time frame? She goes, uh, mid, mid to late 40s. And I immediately kind of had a song in mind. We represented the Jack Lawrence portion of If I Didn't Care by the Ink Spots. And she went back to the director, Frank Darabont, and that, that literally that night, she goes, perfect, perfect. If I didn't care, it's going to be the opening, it ended up being the opening credits of Shawshank Redemption, you know, which was, which, which was a cool thing, which I was credited on the soundtrack, but not in the film, but that's a whole political <laughs> thing. Ah, yes. Po politics actually uh, brings me to, well, not that kind of politics. We don't have to go there necessarily, but um, the, the, what has happened with streaming and that i i guess is political within like the the confines of the industry how how do you see that all unfolding any further because i know there are some people who are not as thrilled a lot of artists are not as thrilled with the whole streaming concept um what has your experience been you mean streaming streaming audio just yeah. streaming well, you know, look, I think what's happened, we've come a long, long way. I've been in the business a long time in terms of regulations, yeah. you know, and there are people in Washington and there are, there are great industry committees with some fabulous people who I've known for years. And they're getting these, uh, the laws are getting more and more stricter um, uh, to, uh, to protect the creators, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, these guys, this is, these, these, these people are making a living off of their the, this the, the work that they create and for years and years you know there have been these uh, unauthorized use of copyright uh, lost income but I, I i like the fact that they're getting more strict you know now certainly in the last um you know eight to ten years where the internet's become big and youtube's become big for years and years and years there was no uh revenue for the creators uh, but now the the laws are getting stricter, and uh, which which is fabulous. Um, and uh, so I, I think you're seeing that it's becoming more and more regulated. Still, still a ways to go, but there's been terrific progress. So uh, I'm optimistic that um, any you know the great thing that I say to the writers, you know, uh, is that uh, there used to be. Uh, uh, three or four ways you can generate income. It's through your record sales, um, through print, through synchronization, uh, and through obviously the performing rights societies. But now there's so many more platforms, digital platforms that are revenue generating opportunities only gonna help the creators, the, the, the composers and the producers. It will only help them going forward um, that, all these various sources of, of revenue streams. So I, I think in the long run, it's, you know, once these things all become more regulated, um, I think it's great. It's great because um, it's just more money for the creators. Have publishing 
organizations suffered similarly because of that in the same way that studios and record companies uh, to some extent have because it, you can put your own music out. You can make it. You don't need a studio. You can get it onto YouTube and monetize through ads or any of that kind of stuff. What impact has that had on publishers? Well, publishers, the publishers are pretty much protected because if that song is recognizable and that song is published and it's, it's published, it's protected, it's copywritten, then, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to, to not, uh, not be accountable. If you're u- utilizing that work, that song's going to be recognized. That again, if you, you need to be, you know, you need to have a publisher designate it domestically, internationally. It's important, you know, because there are sub publishers around the world that protect the writer's interest. So the and publisher, a, a person who's independent, still needs the support of a publishing organization. They can't really no. just copyright it themselves, and, and then it, the problem with that is. It's a lot of work. Right. It's a lot of, work. and I know friends and people, and I know uh, writers who uh, decided that they want to uh, they want to control it, administer it themselves. You know, they cut deals overseas with uh, with uh, publishing companies that collect in different territories. But if you're doing it yourself, you know, it's it's a lot of work, and you know, things fall through the cracks. That's a good thing about having a publisher. Because their their job is to uh, is to make sure that uh, the, everything is accounted for. Now the problem I know with some writers, very famous uh, songwriters, they have copyrights in some of these big companies. You know, when when you're when you're when you've got four million plus copyrights, it's very very difficult with with uh, not big staffs anymore. Everyone's cutting down. Opportunities get lost promotion gets lost and so if you're a a songwriter do as much as you can to help promote don't don't depend upon somebody else you know marketing and promoting your rights you know it's all about networking and know who the music supervisors are you know because man you know they they've got a number of scripts for the next you know couple of months um and um everything's negotiable you know i mean you you see it you know, you, you can see a song uh, and, and hear a song in a movie or a commercial and, uh, and it fits great. But you know what? Uh, 5,000 other songs would have fit just as good. And what's right. the difference? Well, maybe that publisher or that writer had a relationship with the music supervisor or the ad executive, you know. And, and again, in many cases, you know, it just it, it comes from within. Uh, uh, they they already have in mind what they want and it's written into the script. And um, so, you know, it happens, it happens many different ways. Well, it just made me think of, I, not to say I was disenchanted because I, when I got in the music I, in, into business full time, I was in my early twenties and I just started to see how the hot dog was made. And right. Right. What's really interesting, like you just shared, it's on all levels, is just because you have a publisher or just because you have a record deal or just because you have these certain um, contracts does not mean you get to sit back and someone else is going to do all the work for you. You no. still, as a band, have to go out and promote yourself. You still, as a songwriter, have to go out and build the relationships and get it in there. I remember when I got my, when I got, I mean, I had a record deal and same thing happened. And then I had uh, my first uh, publishing deal on a book. And I was right. like, oh, great. They're going to, you know, it's with Simon and Schuster. They're going to, you know, totally, you know, hook it yeah. up. And no, it's still up to me to be calling up the bookstores and be like, oh, I want to, you know, and it's so interesting where it's true. everywhere in life, the people who succeed take personal responsibility and they're willing to do the extra, go the extra mile, as it were, that it's not the end zone. The end game isn't get signed. The end game is do something with getting signed. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Look, record companies, uh, you know, in the day, you know, we can think about, you know, when, when there were, you know, six, seven majors that exist. Now there's like two. <laughs> but, um, you know, a band would get signed and, and they would have a three to four record deal. Right now, the music industry, the record industry is kind of like the movie industry where 
the success or failure seems to fall on the first weekend of a movie. You pretty much know, you know, by Sunday night after you, you're reviewing those box office receipts, whether or not you have a successful movie. Same with a record. They don't have any patience anymore. If it doesn't happen quickly, boom, they're on to the next one. Years ago, you know, when it was, you know, uh, uh, Ahmed Erdogan and, and, and Mo Austin and, and, and Lenny Warnaker and all the, they gave, you know, um, they, they gave an artist that they believed in a shot. Now it's very quick and it has to happen quickly. Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting how that impacts how records or how anything is right. done. And, and sadly, I think what happens as well is that it, it impacts the, the time and that may be why the quality for some experiences has gone down because they're also, they're already knowing they're not going to be putting tons of effort into getting it to the next level. So they put about the same amount of energy into the creation as they do into the promotion, which is going to be short lived. So there's, there's less attention paid to the quality yeah. on some level. Right. And that's why I always say, you know, nowadays where, where the record companies really went to bat for you in the day, now, pretty much, you, you got to pretty much take it down the field yourself. I mean, right down to the 10 yard line. And if they see all the work you've done, they see that you've got, you've got followers, they see that, that all of this is happening, then the record company uses their muscle pretty much for the last 10 yards. Mm -hmm. but, but the days of them taking an artist, you know, from one side of the field and bringing them all, no, nah, it doesn't really happen that way, realistically. And, um, and I, you know, I think that's how to do it for yourself. That's been a slow, well, not slow, but I, I even witnessed that in, you know, my day. You know, I was, uh, I started in the, uh, in the 90s. That was when my, you know, experience like really started to get, you know, full on. And I noticed that too, that the bands that, like we're like I knew bands who were signed bands. They all had day jobs, and that they'd go right. out on tour. But they're like, we're not making money on that. And then I remember the shift. Uh, my manager was um, like Brian Doyle and those guys, and they sure. were uh, managing uh, Hall and Oates, and right. and they were like, Hall and Oates made their first million dollars each on the lowest selling record that they put out themselves. They never made that yeah. kind of money. When they right. had, they were selling those millions and millions of records, they made nothing compared to when they did it themselves. Amazing, yeah. Sure. So it's just, it was like interesting. That, and I was watching that. And I'm like, man, you don't need a record company. As a matter of fact, you'd probably be better off doing it yourself, just like you said, get to that 10 yard line and then right. they'll help you scale. Well, here's the great thing about technology and the industry today it's never been more true. Um, where, you know, years ago, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, certainly 20 years ago, where if you were an artist and you were going to have success, you needed to be signed by a major. Not anymore. There, there, there are so many incredible independent labels that exist. Um, and it's always going to come down to the artist and the song, you know, I mean, it, it's always, it always comes down to that. Um, you know, Anyone thinks, you know, I mean, look, YouTube is, is in, and, and the digital platforms are great tools. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are some great stories where somebody was discovered that way, but they're few and far between. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a great tool, but independent and learning as much as you can about publishing uh, uh, the record industry, marketing, promotion, you know, uh, touring, you know comes down to the song if you've got those great songs you know they're gonna they're, they always come shining through they really do but networking is important you know having a relationship um with the performing rights societies all that it's it's networking you know and and, and but uh, but do as much of it don't depend upon anybody uh, to do anything for you you know yeah i i mean your network is your net worth on on yeah. every level um you know so how, without naming names, right, but you've been around, and this is something that always kind of bothered me in the industry, there would always be a few artists or bands that I didn't get how they were able to be so successful. 
like, did you, have there been any songs where you like passed on and you were like, oh, no way, this isn't going to work. And oh. then, and then you're like, holy crap, that, that, that blew up. I, I, well, you can name I, names if you want. I just, I, 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 had, I had a few instances. I'm not going to name names of why they didn't happen. There were, I can name a couple of projects that I had, that I had, um, uh, which were unknown artists at the time. And uh, I was vetoed on it and, and I, I wasn't able to bring them in. Uh, but um, one of them was a little record you may have heard of Jagged Little Pill, an artist hmm. named Alan Morissette. Yeah. I had an opportunity for that early on. Um, you know, there, there, there were a number of, um, there were a, a number of artists that, that, uh, you know, again, my career has not really been in the artist business. Right. You know, I, in the art, I've been in the copyright business and the song business and the licensing business pretty much. So, um, there were a couple of opportunities for me, uh, to, uh, to sign people, but the situation I was in at the moment, they were not into that type of uh, industry. They they were not into that type of business. So, you know, that get that gets frustrating. And then you see it have success down the road. Um, you know, I, I've seen it happen. I know it's happened to friends of mine who've let. Have you seen dance. it happen conversely, where you were like, uh, "No, I don't, I don't see it happening," and then it did. Uh, we well, yeah, well, you know what. Um, yeah, there was, uh, um, as a matter of fact, if I have the record here, I may have it in the room. Uh, I have some of my memorabilia. Um, yeah, well, it, it gets back, it gets back to that. Um, it, there were a couple of records that, uh, I, I, I thought were okay. And I, I, and one in particular, uh, I thought was going to, uh, uh, and I thought the record was good. And I thought they could sell, and I and I thought I was being very generous. I thought it, I, I thought it could be a gold record. I thought it could sell possibly five, uh, uh, five hundred thousand records, which is not an insult, you know. Uh, it ended up being jagged little pill, and it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and and I remember you know getting a CD saying a signed CD saying it. Five five hundred thousand. Thanks for the support, but it was you know I mean, uh, you, you never know you know I mean yeah. what catches fire you know. Well, yeah, it's exactly. I mean, I remember uh, you know you know Shane Keister. I love Shane Keister. He's so, in Nashville. Yeah, Shane's he's amazing. One of the great musicians, and and in Nashville, he's kind of like if there's a if if there's a award show. G, uh, it's him. The CMAs yep. or anything, the musical director is Shane Keister, unbelievable. And by the way, I don't think people realize, like, uh, you know, those big hits for Five for Fighting, you know, all the keyboards on that. That yep. was Shane, uh, Engling Dan and John Ford Coley, big keyboard. That's Shane. He also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he played with Elvis. When he was like 12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was a, like a virtuoso. <laughs> Uh, no, he was super talented guy, hilarious, yeah. great friend. He, he shared yeah. the story. He's like, he played on like on all the big records of the country records yeah. of the '70s and stuff. And he goes, yeah. man, he goes, uh, he goes, you know, I got to be honest. He goes, sometimes I don't trust my gut. He said, I remember I'm sitting there with Kenny Rogers, do finish the record, and I'm sitting there to Paul Lime, the drummer. He goes, I don't, I don't get it. I said, I, it's a song I just don't get. Like, I, this is going to be, it's, I feel bad. This is going to be a bad record. And Paul's like, no, dude, this is going to be a hit. And he's like, nah, it's this song. I know, I just, I, I don't see it happening. It was Lucille. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it, it's just so funny where, like, we all have these perceptions and, and we never know, like, like, sometimes we hear a song and we just go, oh my gosh. Like, uh, yeah. like I remember before I knew, um, the today is gonna be a day. The the um oh, what's the 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 brothers Liam and I don't believe oh. anybody feels okay. the way I do about you now. So that song before it came, like it, I was so involved in like making records at that time that like I didn't get all the hits and all that. We were so focused on right. the pop with Selena and all that. Right. 
So this right, kid right. comes in and he starts playing like he's for like he's doing like an audition for a college thing or something. He's like he, he's like one of those, you know, like come in for an hour and record something acoustically. And he comes in and he does. He starts playing this song. I'm like, this song's amazing. Like this guy's got to get a deal. Like he's got to come in. And then some I, I like brought someone in to play him. So I'm like, check out this kid, you know, this kid's song. And they were yeah. like, dude, this is it's a cover. Like this is already a huge hit. I'm like, oh, yeah, awkward. But like great songs are great songs, but then other times we just like, I don't know, it's sometimes I don't get it sometimes. Yeah, you know, look, I'm, I'm a lover of songs, you know, and, and every genre, you know, and I, I, gosh, I think I, you know, back in the, like, like Tom Bell and Linda Creed, the Philadelphia sound and, and a lot of the great R&B artists and uh, my, you know, my, I, I spanned across the board, you know, right from, from the Sinatra standards, uh, you know, to uh, obviously no one on earth doesn't love Motown, you know, and everywhere in between. So I kind of, I have an appreciation for all these types of genres and certain songs, I guess that you hear and you say, eh, I don't get it. Um, you know, I, I don't get many of those, you know, because I mean, usually, you know, hindsight, you know, I mean, I, I, I've heard, I've heard demos before, and and I'll be honest with you, the one demo that I heard back in the God mid eighties, um, were these uh, uh, were these uh, uh, records at Virgin, and they were they were Paula Abdul, and I loved them. I thought they were great pop songs. It ended up being the Forever Your Girl album, and she had about four or five hits off of that record. Mm -hmm. Didn't start out good. But I remember hearing that and saying, my God, I think they've got a hit record here. Um, and, um, you know, and and I remember hearing because um, uh, I spent a lot of time over at Media Sound Recording Studios when it was on 57th Street. And so many great records were developed. And that was the first time I heard Whitney Houston. I couldn't freaking believe her voice. Yep. That's the most unbelievable, purest, most solid incredible voice i think i've ever heard in person you know when i when i've heard her perform um so i've been very fortunate you know and and um but there's not many things i say eh you know i guess that's a you know i mean there are certain things i'm I, i'm maybe not you know like i said i have an appreciation for all music you know uh maybe punk music i can't follow that good <laughs> you know maybe heavy metal i can't really you know I, I mean i appreciate the creators i appreciate them but you know i i like melody always loved lyrics you know i've always i've, I've always loved songs you yeah know? when you were uh, a writer what kind of music what type of songs were you i, I, I thought i was um i was a lyricist and i loved hal david you know and and I always loved Backrack David. So I, I I wrote lyrics, you know. I was a lyric writer, and it was. You still write poetry or lyrics or anything? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I'm pretty good at, with writing. I've written some lyrics. I, I mean, we covered, recorded some of the uh, some of the songs over the years, uh, you know, and um, you know, and and again, I mean, I mean, I've had a couple of covers, but nothing nothing to brag about. The one thing I learned. Uh, the one thing I learned in business, in business and, and writers and success, that the one thing about success, the hardest thing about being successful is that you've got to continue to be successful. You know, it, it, it is the hardest thing about being successful. You've got to do it over and over and every day is an audition. Do you think that that's every part of the reason that some people give up is because they know that inherently that if they get to a certain level, the work that it's going to take to stay at that level is what scares some people? Well, maybe it's hard to get into other people's heads because everybody is really different. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any two people on the planet earth that think or act or, you know, have the no, same. No, but there are certain consistencies, but, right, that we want to look for, like to, to model the successful people is the, the person who is able to maintain that level of success has conditioned themselves to appreciate or enjoy well, the, that level of uh, effort. Well, look, the way, if, if I'm answering this correctly, 
successful people, whether it's in music, it's creative, whether it's business, you know, I honestly think you're born with two dreams. The people that are ultra successful, they're born with a creative dream and they're born with a desire gene. You know, it's that work gene. You know, I mean, there's some people out there that are, that are, that are lazy. They want it to happen. I get, like I said, everyone's different. Everyone's motivated by something different. But um, the desire gene to me is, 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 is more impressive even than the creative gene. You know, I know some people who are, they have the most desire. The, the work ethic is like nothing I've ever seen, but they just don't have it. And I've seen it with artists. That breaks my heart. When you see an artist who works like nothing you've ever seen, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just not there creatively. And then what pisses me off is the inc incredibly talented, talented people that are lazy and they don't take advantage of, of the gift, you know? But again, that's, you know. Um, so of all but, the people that you've worked with, all the super successful and all of that, is there a um, thread of consistency, something, an attribute that you notice beyond the desire and the creativity? Is there something that, whether it's a mindset that you notice, is it a level of confidence? Is it a level yeah. of like Man, that I it what, factor? I, I hear what you're saying. Cause like I'm in awe of anyone that has consistent success. Like I said, the hardest thing about being successful is that you've got to continue to be successful over and over and over and over again. And there are some people out there, and, and believe it or not, I even had this conversation once with Lionel Richie. Um, we have a really close mutual friend, and man, this guy is just a hit machine, and he, he, he just so, so unbelievably consistent. You know, some people are just born with genius. And I read this book, great book, and I remember what this book was, but it was about genius where, and, and it talked about some of the great geniuses in, in, in the literary world and the business world and the entertainment world. Pretty much most genius has a shelf life, you know, there's an expiration date where all of their great works, you know, and you can point to a lot of people where it was a period of time, you know, I mean, some people that had, were prolific in the 60s or 70s or 80s they ain't doing it today you know you ever think about that you know the guys that just had hit after hit after hit and they're writing and still producing work today and it's just not resonating you know i wonder if part of that it makes me think of uh do you remember napoleon dynamite oh the movie yeah so you remember uh, uncle ricky yeah yeah of course always reliving his high school day yeah, right they're on the <laughs> ball right like i wonder That's if great. for some you know that they're not progressing they're not transforming that they're still writing they still are they, they never adapted and grew right. as as a right. artist or a creator right. or what have you right. and they're still trying to write the same hit right same right. formula that got that hit that maybe time tested, but they didn't adjust. Right. Um, it, now you're getting into an interesting um, space of reinventing. Right. You know, reinventing yourself, you know, um, you know, reinventing yourself, which is really interesting. I think the, the, um, I, boy, I could talk about that for, for, for hours about reinventing. You know, like I said, you know, when you get you get older, you get wiser. You don't necessarily get smarter, but you 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 take all of these circumstances and situations and people you've you've met, and if you're you're, you're wise enough, you use those, you know, to navigate the landmines as you go forward. You know, um, but uh, the reinventing process, because I, I think you you can't be one dimensional. You know, I think I think. Um, that's why it's important to appreciate all the music that's out there, you know? I mean, kind of, you know, I mean, there's good and bad music in every genre, you know? I think we all know that, you know? But the reinventing part of it 
you know, um, for writers and again, and particularly if you had success before, right? Where are you? Okay. I, look, I, I'm a great example of that because I, I remember there was a time for me when I had a great run and then I wasn't sure what the next chapter was. And you stop for a minute and say, holy crap, what, what next? I was given the best advice, okay, by a guy, an old friend of mine, you may know him, by the name of Billy Terrell. I'll never forget. And um, four words. He said, stay in the game, mm. you know? And, it, do and it's, it doesn't matter if there's money attached to it, prestige attached to it take a project, become uh, an assistant of an assistant of an assistant, if you can become a, an, a, an associate producer, an executive producer on a project, but if it's a quality project, stay in the game. Because ultimately, you know, that's gonna lead to this, it's gonna lead to that, to this person and that, and, and I did. I took some projects, I took some projects at a, at a time where I wasn't sure if it was over, and I took on some projects and there was no money attached to it, but there was a credit, mm -hmm. you know, there was a credit, there was, it, 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 there was visibility, you know, and it, it allowed me uh, to keep the name out there, you know, um, again, this is being completely transparent, you know, some people don't want to admit the fact that, you know what, not everything runs smooth, not everything is great, you know, you're going to have shit periods. and. Um, um, I've been very fortunate because I've, I've had a career, I've had a reputation where I've, I've, I've always been pretty candid to people and I've, I've always had opportunities to work on things. Um, and um, still to this day with a new company that we're starting um, at the end of the year. But, um, but the whole reinvention process, you know, and, and again, it's very hard, I think, if you're a uh, a star or somebody who's who's had enormous success to come out i mean you know uh to come out and 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 do a duet with a current successful group you know and 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 and, and get on stage with somebody and you know because i've had the conversation with those people they say well how can i can i looks like i'm trying to ride on their coattails you know i can't do that you know you think that's so what Steven a, Tyler thought when they were they did uh, with Run DMC or like? Well, it could have been. I mean, I don't know Steven, but you know, though that was a great collaboration, man. Yeah. I mean, that amazing collaboration. Uh, but some people shy away from the collaborations. Uh, uh, some and that's crazy because if I look at like the super groups of the '60s, right? Blind Faith and like all these incredible right. groups that got together, and then. I saw that's how a lot of the rap artists were able to blow up because they collaborated and they would do the like sure. almost their same version of super groups. Um, right. And like, to me, that's a no brainer. I think that th right. that is ultimately, isn't that why we're on this planet is to collaborate and work together and then to do the way it should be. That's yeah. The way it, and that's the way it should be. And, and look, we see it in the freaking streets today, unfortunately, you know, I mean, that, that, you know, there's, there's got to be a, a, a come together Jesus moment where at some point, you know, we all have to do it uh, well, professionally I, and personally. I like to think then that, you know, because I've had to reinvent myself multiple times as, as well, is that there it is. Everyone, anyone who says that they don't, is bullshit. Or they, or they don't recognize it as a reinvention. They don't, they don't, they can't appreciate it. But it's, it's not comfortable. It's painful no, sometimes no, to, because you're in some sense, and, and this is you know, where we're seeing it in all aspects of life, but you're almost letting go of a part of who you are. It's like letting go of part of your identity. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a really challenging experience for a person because the strongest need in our psychology is to be congruent with the way we identify ourselves. And then if we like, take away some of that identity, then we're left with, well, who am I? Right. In, instead of going, who do I want to be? Sure. And yeah, and it's certainly, you know, for people that have been more established, you know, when you're when you're young, you know, you you're going to you're going to make mistakes. You know, you're supposed to make mistakes. You know, I have two two young boys in, you know, in the early 20s, 
you know, uh, part of me wants to protect them from the landmines. And part of me saying, no, you, you got to get your feet burned a bit, kid. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you know, that that will only make you grow. You know, it'll only it'll make you stronger. You know, um, you know, it, 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 it's uh, again, individuals, they're all motivated by different reasons and circumstances. And uh, but the reinventing, you know, reinventing. And again, I, I, I've, I've done it a couple of times, but I've stayed in it's within the entertainment industry. Right. It, it, that, um, you know, um, have not. But I've been able to utilize all of the things that I was incredibly successful with and they always apply. The language always applies, you know, right. now, whether you're a good marketing person, whether you were a marketing person for um, dish towels or shoes, you know, you can, you can take those basic principles and do it in any industry, you 100%. know, you, you know, and that's, that's the one thing, you know, you know, maybe some of the terminology changes, but it's all the same. There's really only is. so many ways you could draw a square. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, and also knowing the driver, I remember, and, and Dee's going to, Dee was actually the very first guest I ever had on this. Like, I started this, this is my third time doing this show. Like, it comes out, I do it in like, like kind of spurts. Right, right, but right. But Dee did originally, and um, we were friends, I helped, I co-produced the second Widowmaker record, and, and we became close. And I remember talking to him back then, I don't know if I covered it with him on the show, but he shared with me part of his reinvention back in the day. He's like, I was sitting in my pool. I don't have a care in the world. I've, you know, sold, you know, millions of records and all that. And I'm trying to write a song. And I realize that I'm not pissed off about anything anymore. Right, right. Hey. And yeah. he goes, I couldn't, I, for him, he, and what he had to reinvent was his purpose his reason for writing and all of that. And then he was able to reframe it all. And then he ended up getting a song on Celine Dion and Rosie Donald's Christmas yep. record and, and all of that yep. later on, which has nothing to do with rock. So and, he was- And now, and now you hear Dee doing narration yeah. on shows like Access TV. And I'm watching the TV and I'm saying, oh my God, that sounds like Dee. That's that's D Snyder, and then you see the credits roll, and you know, and it's it's D. So talk about you know reinventing, you know. And um, look, I I actually happen to have some few really good friends. One I will not mention his name. Hugely successful in the rap business for a long, long time, but he had that same problem. He was a writer and a producer, and had a lot of success. He's living really well right now, and he told me um, that. Those so early songs that I wrote, I, I don't have the same perspective, mm. and because I'm I'm actually living here in 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 actually moved to uh, um, to uh, uh, Beverly Glen, I think it is really nice up there, and um, and he says yeah, it changed his perspective on it, so he's reinvented himself, and now now he's making movies and he's doing really well. well yeah. And I, whenever, like as personal development and, and working with people, I work a lot with identity and I, to kind of as an, an analogy, similar to, to that is when I look at guys like, you know, you could be Dwayne The Rock Johnson, right? Reinvented himself right. from right. wrestler right. to the actor that he is. But then a guy like Ice Cube, right? Who yeah. was, you know, like pretty I hardcore and then he's doing Disney movies. Right, right, right. No, no look, he's a great story. You know, he's, yeah, it's, he's it's you amazing. Know, where been, yeah, people get locked into uh, sometimes an identity that um, the power of that identity got them somewhere, and sadly, sometimes the power of that identity keeps them stuck. No question about it. And sometimes, you know, what fate arrives and it and it finds you, you know. Uh, personally and professionally, mm -hmm. you know, it finds you a cause, a person, or a, a, a circumstance. Look, I, I happen to be getting involved with a new digital network mm -hmm. called the Y Network, it's launch, being launched at the end of this year. And um, uh, four of the most incredible, successful media people from radio, uh, from TV merchandising, 
and we got together and we have different perspectives of our careers in media and collectively we had this incredible vision and we've started and actually we're we're going to be launching it's you know we felt that uh, that there's a lot of a uh, subscription fatigue for consumers everywhere you turn you got to spend 9.99 for a netflix or a hulu yeah. with it. so we've got a free this will be a free platform but it's going to have uh, uh you know you'll be able to watch it where when and how you want to watch it on your devices but it's going to be some original content, uh, recognizable content. And again, I never thought I would be in that space, but I'm utilizing the principles that I did for my marketing, product development, licensing area. And, um, you know, you know, if, if, if you've had any success, if you've had a job in your life, you're going to be able to utilize that somewhere else. You know, it does, it transfers, you know, it, it does transfer. And, um, you know, and what's, uh, what's so interesting, and as you're sharing it with, with the transformation, the word that just came up for me is humility. Yeah. To yeah. be able to go, okay, I've done some great stuff. I could take those skills with me. And right. I'm humble enough to know that there are other opportunities. There are other people that I could do business with. So you talked about those. If you didn't have a level of humility, you wouldn't be able to work with those four other moguls to go. <laughs> Like, hey, yep. let's all add to this picture. And and they're we're all pretty much kind of alpha people, but it's a good thing. And we're all competitive, but in a really, really good way. It's not a negative competition. And, um, you know, they make me want to be better, you mm -hmm. know, and then I like something makes them better. And I think, you know, it, it's teamwork, man. I mean, that's the way it should be in, in life in general, you know. And, um, you know, you hope that one day I get – to live long enough to see it, you know, but, um, but like I said, this, this collaboration is great because we all have strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're able to cover each other's strengths and weaknesses. That's why I feel really comfortable. If I'm not really familiar with it, I know one of my partners has it covered. Right. And, and if we don't, we're all one phone call away from getting the answer. That's a great thing about, you know, having experiences and, and Rolodexes and, and a history. Awesome. Well, how can we support, like, I, I know you're going to launch at the end of the year. Is there, you know, and depending on when people are listening to it, if it's already out, you know, in the future, no, Y Network's probably going to be blow out. No, but, it's going to be called the Y Networks, and that's going to be coming out. You'll see more about it as we get closer to the end of the year. Uh, but, you know, we, we struck deals with, uh, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, uh, for reruns and uh, feature films that everyone knows. And we're working with some really good companies at creating original content. So it's originally, it's going to start with three or four channels, but it's, we're going to have everything from comedy to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, TV merchandising, uh, selling, home shopping, selling. Well, as you uh, know, I'm throwing my hat in the ring for the personal development channel. Well, that we want to have every aspect and the great thing about it, it's a free platform, you know, and um, like I said, people have uh, subscription fatigue, but this is going to be uh, certainly uh, run by via marketing and advertising. That's what's going to uh, generate the revenue to keep us going. And um, you know, you just, the, the only thing constant in life is change, you know, and you've got to keep going with it and you got to check your ego at the door. and. Um, you know, just move forward. And that's, uh, that's what you have to do in, in anything. Well, if looking back at your career, your experiences, and you shared a little bit, you know, with, with your children, um, is there any advice that you would give a younger self, um, knowing what you know now, the experiences that you have, any, any lessons that you would have uh, potentially have avoided learning by, you know, experience had you been given uh, certain advice? That, well, that's a good question. You know, um, um, see, I don't do any interviews. So, uh, you know, I, some people that, that are constantly doing interviews, they have prepared answers, right. you know, because they've said it many, many, many times. Uh, look, when you're young, you're going to make mistakes right? You're going to make mistakes personally and professionally and, but you, you hope to grow from them, you know? Um, 
the one thing is I, I, I like experienced people. You know, uh, I see that as an asset, although companies today see it as a liability. Mm. You know, experience and longevity should be an asset, not a liability. And some companies, you know, they'll get rid of somebody with experience because they make too much money and we'll bring four young people in. You know, that's, uh, right. I, I guess that happened when I was young and we were young. And I guess that's the way that, that the transformation takes place. Um, I don't think I'd really do, you know, the great line in in the in in my way. Regrets I had a few, but then again, too too few to mention. Mm. But um, and you did it my way. There was a great line, and I love the Rocky movies, and I'll tell you why. Because um, when the first Rocky movie came out, I was seventeen, right? And you're seventeen. You're looking for something to inspire you and motivate you. And that movie had all those aspects of, and 30 years later, there was a Rocky, another Rocky movie, 30, when I was at a real turning point. And he had a, a dialogue in, in a scene with his son mm -hmm. that stuck with me. And he said, you know, kid, you can't blame this and that. He goes, because life is hard. It's tough. It will beat you down. It'll beat you down, but it's not how hard you get hit, but it's how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. Right? We're all going to get the shit kicked out of us yep. in some way or another, but keep moving forward. How do you keep take the punches and keep moving forward? I took a lot of punches. I've kept moving forward. I'm really happy where I am today, personally and professionally. Um, can you and, think of a time uh, when you did get hit and you were like ready to give up? Was there ever a time when there was a part oh. of you that was like, ah, man, maybe I ought to just toss it in the yeah. towel? So how did you yeah. keep that? What was your thought? What was your energy? What was your state that kept you moving even I though you were hit? I didn't want to fail. didn't want to fail. I didn't want to disappoint. You know, then, I mean, look, I, I, I didn't start a family until it was later in life, you know? Um, so when I had my kids, I, you know, I, 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 and I've always been very conservative and invested and I, I never really, fortunately not would have, have had any financial issues. I've always been very smart with, um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I always made sure that I didn't, uh, I, I lived under my means, mm -hmm. you know, which is something I would suggest to anyone, you know. Yeah. You make a dollar, you know, and less than you earn 50 cents, maybe 60 cents. Um, but, um, but what, you know, I, I just didn't want to fail. I guess, I guess, again, that's, that was the, the personal ego, you know, I didn't want to disappoint. I didn't want to disappoint family. I didn't want to disappoint friends and I didn't want to disappoint, you know, myself, you know? So, when things get bad, you get angry, and that's always a good thing. You get angry and you say, okay, you know, it just, you know, it's, but again, when you're younger, things, you can't see things in a practical way. You know, you're much more emotional, you know, but if you're, you know, you're older, you take a break and, okay, you know, let's fix it, you know. You know, there's nothing that can't be repaired, pretty much, uh, when it comes to careers you know um but um but and we're still learning right we're still learning well we're yeah that's what's so interesting and, and the the complexity of being human is the wisdom you talk about is taking experience and learning from it and and so forth and yet at the same time as we get older we don't want to lose that childlike creativity and right. curiosity and then right. that juxtaposition of well like because I, it just seems like in so many levels that it's like a maturity thing in all areas of life, right? Yeah. And and where, what stage are we at in maturity? Are we acting like you know teenagers? Are we acting like you know? Are we taking risks that are you know right. not calculated? And you know right. sometimes it serves us, sometimes it doesn't, and and it's just such a complex thing. Which is what I think one of the things you shared that is so important and brilliant is the team. 
that if you're yeah. in the right team and the ecosystem yeah. is there to support you, they could say, hey, Bill, you should probably put a parachute on before jumping out yeah. of that plane. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I've always had great editors, by the way. And, and I had this great assistant for years and years and years and years. She's wonderful. Her name is Jessica Bumstead. So there were times when I would write a memo uh, or do something, you know, uh, uh, or, or send a note out to uh, someone, whatever. Um, and uh, she would, you know, she would, she was a good, really good editor, but more importantly, she'd come into the room. Now if I fired out something to somebody at Paramount or somebody at Warner Brothers or Universal um, regarding a, a license or whatever it, it may have been or Capitol Records. And I said, just, can you just kind of double check the, uh, you know, the, the content on it? And she'll come back to me and she'll look at me. And she'll go, Bill, you really want to say this? Yeah, Jess, I want to say, Bill, do you really want to take this approach? And then, well, you know, so I've always relied on feedback. I don't have the freak answers. None of us do. Anybody who believes they do, you know, it's, it's not true. But, but I've always had someone that made me better. You know, she made my memos better. These guys that I'm working with right now really make me better. Um, and, um, you know, so, so yeah, you know, I mean, I've always had somebody to uh, collaborate with, you know, make me better, you know, and that's, uh, you know, you, 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 you hope it continues, you know, and um, that's, that's all we can ask for. Well, and what you've shared brilliantly is that these are the choices that we make. Yeah. We choose our environment. We, you know, based on, look, there's some people, there's some things we can't change. And then we make a decision with what we have. Now, what environment am I going to put myself in? And, and I've lived that. Like, right. I always, if I'm the smartest person in the room, need a new room. If I'm the, you know, I, and, and here's what's interesting. And maybe, you know, this is the last kind of thought with all this. I've always put myself into environments where I was the least talented. The challenge with that is when I'm hanging out with the A-listers, hanging out with, you know, like Shane yeah. and D and like all right. these incredible people, my musical prowess, my ability, and Russ, I mean, you know, making records with Russ. I mean, Russ is an incredible musician, like in, on all levels compared to Russ. I'm, That's you know, Russ DeSalvo, for those people Russ DeSalvo. Oh, yeah. The guy's yeah. amazing. He's amazing. And he's going to be on, on this as well. Um, compared to, to those artists and those musicians and, and those people, I'm nothing, but I'm so blessed that I can play in the game with them. Like, I know enough to play in the game. I can't play like Russ, but I can communicate with them. But I, it always but, had to balance. So I feel like, insignificant in that no but see that's just it they're right. smart people and they're drawing from you whether they say it or not they're learning from you you know well, I, in addition of, of course you and know? i know that and i'm sure I, yeah. I i share this to help people with the mindset on putting themselves in an environment that is intimidating that you said something really interesting because i've always said i i i would love i love batting sixth in the lineup you know I love batting sixth in the lineup. I don't want to be the leadoff hitter. I don't want to bat cleanup. I love being sixth. That's a, that to me was a really good place to bat in the lineup, you know? And, um, and another thing that I've always had and I've used, I don't know what your take on this is. Um, and you, you see that because you're getting back to the point when you were talking about songs that you, how did that make, you know, how, how, how did that become a hit or something like that? There's an old saying, I don't know where I once heard it, but I use it often. I'd rather be lucky than good. Mm. You know, sometimes I know luck is preparation and opportunity coming together, but sometimes it's luck, you know? <laughs> sometimes, you know, I'd rather be lucky than good, you know? And, um, but um, that, that's, that's a, another component to, to the world we live in. You know? Well, and I think though that luck does show up when you're in the game. Yeah, got to be in the game, stay in the game, which was the 
four best words I've ever yeah. heard. I, and to, to like kind of outside of music, a similar thing happened with my father. He was a executive vice president of a publicly traded bank and they got purchased and he was in his, probably in his fifties, got purchased. You know, what do you think the new board did as soon as they came in? Got rid of all the upper management. So here he is, top level guy looking for a gig. And like you shared, there are companies who would rather have four, you know, like right. cheap people than pay for the one big guy. So yeah. he was out of work and he had to reinvent himself. And what he right. did was he went and he got a job being like doing title searching. And I'm like, right. Dad, why are you doing that? He goes, because I'm in the game. He goes, I could do yeah. this with my eyes closed. I, but I, if I sit and play golf, I, he says, I don't have to work. But if I sit and play golf for the rest of, you know, the rest of my days, I, you know, I'd probably kill myself. Like, he didn't say that right. exactly. Right, but right, he's like, right. if I'm doing that, swallow some pride. I'm in right. the game and I'm meeting people. And then yeah. within short order, an opportunity came his way. He bought a business, created a mortgage company, did a bunch of things and, and kind of brought it all back. But it never yeah. would have happened if he just sat on his laurels. Um, oh. And similar to what you've shared. And that's part of the reinvention process is the, the willingness to take a couple steps back. Oh, absolutely. Got to go backward to go forward. I, I mean, look, everyone will eventually be in that place. Everyone will eventually be there. Mm -hmm. oh, my 21 year old eventually will be there, you know, down the road. We all, we, we, we all are. And that's, it, it's, it's how, you deal with the adversity and go forward. You know, yeah. I mean, that's just what it is. You know, you got to you got to plan ahead. And well, it's sometimes hard to plan ahead for situations. Uh, things develop in a lot of different ways. You know, for whatever reason. Well, the reason. planning ahead, I think, also what some people don't realize is the inner resourcefulness. Planning ahead is the also willingness to be creative and right. know that the only thing constant is change so that right. we, we know things are gonna happen. So the preparation is also flexing the mind, flexing the spirit, flexing the, you know, the different parts that when an opportunity comes, we can recognize it and take action on it. Like, right, right. Because had you not been through these incredible ups and downs that you've been through, this new opportunity with Y Networks, you may not have been able to capitalize right. because you might be stuck in an old paradigm. Right, no, absolutely. You know, and, and um, yeah, no, no question about it. You know, and uh, and again, that that was a, as a result of of maintaining the contacts, maintaining you know your your network contacts. That's very important. You know, the the, the network is everything. You know, your network is everything. Network is your net worth. Yeah. Beautiful. No question. Well, awesome, brother. Thank you so much. I know we went a, a little bit uh, long here, but. Uh, I, Gold Feels like shared. we've only been at it for 10 minutes, but I, look, I, I enjoyed talking to you anytime. And, uh, you know, it's, you just let me know if you need any, uh, anything answered. Um, I always, I mean, I, I, I love, you know, reaching out to you and, and sending you any, any opportunities that come along my way. Um, is there any final words of, of advice or thoughts you'd like to, to leave with? And of course, we want to know how to get in touch with you and support whatever your uh, projects are that, you know, Y Networks. Or, yeah, and, you know. Y Network, the Y Networks will be coming up. Uh, and uh, I think you can actually go on to the Y, all one word, the Y, uh, letter Y networks.com. Um, there'll be uh, an initial uh, statement and uh, on that, it'll, it'll give you some. Uh, uh, idea of the other uh, partners and founders of the company and uh, it shares a little bit of, of what we're about to launch but uh, we're excited about it and um, you know uh, again it's all I can say to people is uh, you know it's 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 all about giving a hundred percent not quitting and uh, relying on your experiences and and your network and it's 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 worked for not just me for many 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 people that I know, uh, and um, but uh, hope to uh, be able to share more of it with you guys in the future. Awesome. Well, obviously we're going to be supporting you. Uh, you just reminded me of uh, it was a Jay Z quote um, when you talked about the hard knock life. Um, I saw him. It was like one of these 
he was interviewed. I don't remember who's being interviewed by, but they said, you know, come coming back, you know, from the break, Jay Z is going to share his secret to success. And right. it's like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to wait for this. Right. So I'm, I'm here. I'm waiting with bated breath. I'm like, okay, I just want to, I love hearing people's success formulas. Right. And come back. Say, okay, Jay Z, what made you so successful? He said, what we did was genius. And I'm like, okay, cool. What was genius? He goes, we never gave up. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't, you can't, you can't, you just can't, you can't, there is, there, there, you can't give up. It's, yeah, it's the secret to success is the continued forward momentum, just continue, even if you get pushed back, and that's where the humility comes in, you can maintain your yeah. mindset, okay, I had a couple steps back, but it doesn't change my goal, and that's where the desire that you shared, Napoleon Hill talks right. about that, have a, you know, desire of where it is you want to go, have a vision, right, and then just keep moving. Not, not easy at times, but you know what? You know, at the end of the day, you, you're going to feel good about yourself for continuing to make the effort, you know, because, yeah, we're, we're all, you know, look, we're going to hit bumps in the roads, you know. and, and Cause, Well, because the alternative is worse than the work it takes to keep moving forward. No question. And some people don't realize that, and then they drown themselves, and that's a whole other conversation yeah. in yeah. distractions yeah. And, and more. Well, awesome, brother. Thank you so much for Bye. your time, your vision, your genius. And um, yeah, look forward to, to more fun and, and anything that, of course, I can do. My resources are your resources. Um, you know, my network Bye. is access. So anything you need, please uh, let me know. And um, yeah, thank you again. Be well. Thank awesome, you, Doug. Brother. Thank you. Be Good well. bless. All right. Bye. Peace.